Hello, everyone. I'm Dana Perino, along with Kimberly Guilfoyle, Juan Williams, Jesse Waters, and Greg Gutfeld. It's 9 o'clock in New York City, and this is The Five. We begin tonight with major developments on the terrorism front from all over the world. In Paris today, a man attacked a police officer with a hammer while reportedly shouting, this is for Syria, before police shot and wounded him. And in Australia, a man of Somali descent killed one and took a woman hostage before police shot him dead. ISIS is claiming responsibility. But first, new details are emerging about missed opportunities to Saturday's attack in London. Karam Butt, one of the three London terrorists, even appeared in a British documentary called The Jihadis Next Door. London police haven't yet confirmed it's him in the video, but several media organizations have verified its authenticity. Take a look. The only English white person who's a non-Muslim was part of our group. But because he's white and he's English, he can go. But all of us that were just praying, we have to stay. This is the reality. This is the reality. This is the reality. Don't forget all the laws and all this. This is the reality. It's not really about to be detained. There's no evidence. We were just praying. We can't pray as well. Now, Greg, it might be easiest for, you know, 20, hindsight is twenty twenty, and looking back, like, the jihadis next door might give you a clue that they are actually next door. But do you know if they are actually going to be violent? At what point can the police intervene? And that is, seems to be, like, the big question tonight. Like, how do you deal with this overall? You know what is so strange about this story, about the, the documentaries? That whenever you watch a movie, what do you see at the end? see roughly 100 names, credits, from directors, the writers, the stuntmen, the, the, uh, the hair and makeup, the caterers. Grips. The, grips. There could be hundreds of names. And I'm just wondering how many of them felt compelled to do something when they see the content of the subject that they're looking at. There are many people who knew about this person because they worked on the film, but they didn't do anything about it because of the same thing that we always talk about, fear of being called a racist or Islamophobic, which allows a force field so you can't touch them. I think thinking, what if you divorced uh, re religion from their murderous assertions? Then you would have a serial killer. And what if a serial killer announced before he was going to serial kill his plans publicly beforehand, like one of these terrorists did when they were in, in a, 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 an airport in Italy when he says, I'm going to fight terror? You would... That is not a crime, but you could actually institutionalize them because they're insane. If somebody says that they're going to embark on mass murder, you could probably, out of the, out of the threat, or that he might be mentally ill, put them away. These people are insane. Put them away. And that, I actually think, Kimberly, from, from a legal standpoint, I really am interested in this uh, line. Mm -hmm. that, so there are laws in Britain, and also we have some here, that say, like, if you do this or that, like, if you pledge allegiance to ISIS, then you can be uh, taken into custody. But uh, how, how long do you keep them? What are the charges? How do you defend them? The other thing that's amazing is that they were on public benefits. This just gets more amazing by the minute, doesn't it? It's just so disgusting and appalling because, listen, we have to, like, like bend over backwards to accommodate people that want to murder innocent women and children and destroy everyone's well-being and the life that we know that we live every day. It's sad to me because we are really hindering the ability of law enforcement to do the job that they have been sworn to do to protect and serve. And instead, it's like they want to give apologies to people like this who are telling us directly what it is that's in their hearts, that's in their minds. They are forecasting their intentions, but that's still not good enough. We, what do you want? Like only after the fact that the act is completed, that's sufficient? That's not what the law says. If you can catch people like this conspiring and you can catch like an act in furtherance of, that should be sufficient. And now look, the world has to see this. Can you imagine how offensive and just deeply disturbing it is to the family members that have to watch these videos and hear these words and know that these people were identified and on the radar and absolutely nothing was done? Whose side are you playing for? That's what bothers me so much. I mean, I don't understand. Just, you know, mail it in, hand it over to them. We're sorry. Are you offended? Have we offended your rights to kill us? That's what I don't get. And we're seeing it play out in London, and it's playing out throughout the world, and it's playing out here in the United States. And people are mad about tweets instead. The um, MI5, Jesse, said in 2015 they're under unprecedented pressure, and today they say that they have 3,000 uh, targeted high-risk, like high risk, or, well, uh, uh, jihadis that they are watching. They have 500 who are high-risk, and they have 20,000 
that are former jihadists that they're watching. So you have a risk management problem in terms of resources. You do. It's hard to prioritize these animals. And the guy, but I think was his name, he was low to moderate risk. So could right. you imagine the high risk guys right. that you're looking right. at? Exactly. Um, and I can't believe this guy was on welfare, the welfare terrorists. That would be the New York Post headline the next day. Um, welfare uh, jihad. Welfare jihad. If you're holding up an ISIS flag in the middle of the city, that should be a red flag. That guy should go from medium threat level to high threat level. They're enemies of the state. Greg's right. They're serial killers. If someone walks like a terrorist and talks like a terrorist, they're probably a terrorist. What you are is, if you're a terrorist sympathizer or appear in a video, you're an unlit fuse. And all it takes is one strike of a match and kaboom and people are dead. So. British authorities have to start rounding up unlit fuses right away because they can't let this stuff happen over and over again. It's kind of like child pornography. You treat it like a, an offense that it's a one-strike policy. So if someone shows an interest in distributing and disseminating child pornography or, you know, is online talking about it, mm -hmm. boom, throw the book at them. Right. You've got to do the same thing with jihadists. One, the... Um one of the things that we've been worried about for like the past five, six, five, five or six years is that you were going to have Westerners who were traveling to Syria for training and because they have a Western passport, they were going to be able to come back. The other thing that's happened is that radicalization is sped up. So as ISIS shrinks, its, ter its territory is shrunk, they are out now basically deputizing everybody around the world and saying, don't wait for us, don't even come here to the caliphate, don't try to, just try to do your work there. And the radicalization is sped up so much that now they actually have terrorists that are younger and younger. So to Jesse's point, I understand like the desire to try to round them up, but and then what do you do with them from there? And like what are the charges if they are actually citizens of Western countries? It's very difficult. And again, what you can do in the situation that you just described is you can, if people have dual passports, then take away their for example, yeah. British citizenship yeah. so they can't come Revoke back. Revoke or the country. suspend. So you can take those steps. But I just wanted to respond to what I was hearing and say, you know, Britain's had experience with this before in terms of the Irish issues. Uh, remember the I Northern Irish, what they call the Troubles over in Britain, right? Right. And what they did then was they created almost basically internment camps, right? And they, what they found was it wasn't effective. In fact, it became a recruitment tool for Irish terrorism uh, as it was being perpetrated in Britain. Well, so, that's, that's what people said around the world about Gitmo. Well, that's what people say. I, mean, I, I, don't, they, they, they don't. I think Islamic terrorism is. I, I understand terrorism is terrorism, but I do think that this threat is different, especially well, because at the high, at their height, the MI5 would say that when they were during the troubles, they had about 103 people who were correct. Targeted. So I was coming now I'm to that. I just mentioned 23, uh, almost 24,000 that we so know. So you of. come to to two points. One is the one you're making. You have such a large pool of people, uh, you know, such a large pool of people, and the question becomes. You know, do you want thought police? I mean, so you can't, it's not if you put police, up a flag. It's acts and furtherance of, and it Hang should on. be enough. Let me make my point. Well, that I'm the lawyer make, here, and I'm telling you, you what you're saying is not accurate. Well, what I'm saying is very accurate, so allow not me to make police. it. Which is that if you have a flag, as we saw in that documentary, if you are saying outrageous things, at what point does that then become evidence of extremism or intent to incite violence? And one of the problems that Theresa May, the prime minister, has made is that and she was homeland in charge of homeland security for the Brits before she became prime minister. She said, you know, it's hard to define extremism under law in a way that's effective and that they're still struggling in Britain with this issue. What you about, the, you what about wait, providing I... material support on behalf of a terrorist? Does well, that, that would be you, different. That's the law. But as we just heard, and this, this came up today because of a YouTube uh, thing that was about how to use a truck to kill people. You know, so the YouTube thing was eventually taken down when the Wall Street Journal called you two. But at what point is that material support? Well, it's more than really? just speech, Juan. If you're Keep speaking about jihad there. and you're trying to encourage the overthrow of the British government right. and you're talking about imposing Sharia law Correct. on the country, unfurling an ISIS flag, and your known associates are a radical cleric who's been imprisoned, mm -hmm. someone that's blown himself up, someone that's on a watch list, and you're a member of a band group, you pile all that together. And you intend right. to take But, you but, you but that's, that's Dana's point, isn't it? Dana just said, by that standard, you know, people looking around saying, now, who qualifies? You've got about 23,000 people. Well, that they know of. Well, you know, who, you know who qualifies in this modern age under this ruse of hate speech 
is it, you can be uh, guilty of hate speech as long as you belong to a certain group. And it's really, really hard to go after radical Muslims because you will be portrayed as going after an aggrieved group. I remember climate change, there were a climate change uh, it, people in the media who said that if you were a climate change skeptic, you should be imprisoned. Mm -hmm. right. Those are the same people that would scoff at you for deporting hate-filled <laughs> imams. They would call you a, a bigot for doing that. When people are enraged over the death of innocent people, they often offer solutions. And I think like we've offered lots of solutions. Trump offers solutions. A lot of people do. What's interesting, there's an entire oppositional side of critics who offer no solutions. They stop at this like, but what about this or what about that? And while condemning the people that come up with the solutions, once you come up with a solution, they go, my God, if you come up with any kind of tool, whether it's a ban or it's vetting or it's a new law. Well, what about they, surveil I was sur surveillance? surveillance? Remember uh, the NYPD coming under such attack by this the is, Associated Press? Right. So what happens? Surveillance. Yeah. yeah. What happens is when you come up with a, 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 a some kind of alternative or some kind of a plan, they will accuse you of being a bigot as a, from a perch of their own cowardice, where they offer false sentiment but on Greg, Twitter, but where they say, what about, what about their rights? These are, when there are radical hate speech imams out there who are, in, who are creating a lot of this rap. Greg, I don't think Theresa May is going to be intimidated by calling, say that she's politically correct. She is trying to stop it. I think the yeah. mayor of London, everybody wants to stop it. The question is one of constitutional rights, your rights to privacy, to free speech, mm -hmm. to organize, to assemble. And how do we conf make that conform right, with what? the Here's fact the that we are battling these monsters? We don't want to become the monsters. But one, well, you the monsters will eat us alive. Like, if we do nothing. Well, no, I, no, nobody said do nothing. Why do you say do nothing? No, that's what I'm he, saying. He, I'm he saying, saying do everything. Yeah, he's saying also tolerance or can consider. make you dead. But I don't want to be dead. If you're too tolerant, if you're too political, But you have correct, provided any dead. ideas or solutions. No, I you think there are lots criticize. of... No, you do. You criticize and find fault with everybody that tries to come forward with an idea. No, that's the case. And impugn them because you think that they have bad intentions and a bad that's hard not, because they want to make no, people safe and fight terrorism. Kimberly, that's not the give what me I'm one doing. idea of what we can do. What I just gave you give one, one a moment ago in terms of stopping people from coming back in by denying them their uh, passport to, to your country. Or suspend. I told you that. But I mean, there are other examples as well. The question is how you do it in an effective way, mm -hmm. not yes, just blanket the, loud rhetoric. It's like, the oh, basis? they're bad people. What is the but that's, basis? That, again, that, that's not what people are you, saying. You they're don't bad think people. They're trying to figure out police. They are. But every time you take. Every time you try to offer some kind of constructive, or maybe sometimes it's, it's an emotional response, you are taking a risk in this society of being called something. So what that does is it tamps down the actual debate so people don't want to talk about it. We have to, we have to loosen the screws here and allow people to talk about the ideas that may be considered dangerous in order to reach maybe some kind of right. decision that isn't dangerous. But we, we can't stop the debate by going, no. We can't talk about that. We should be able to talk that. about it. I don't see that as reality. That's I every think, day in, in fact, the media. In fact, Juan. there is so much fear right now about terrorists in a place like London mm -hmm. that the question is whether or not people go overboard. No, there's also huh. fear of people being labeled underboard. a bigot, too. I don't think I just don't see that. I never hear that from any public official. All right, well, we've got... <laughs> we're not going to oh. solve it in this A block because we've got more coming up. Uh, President Trump is in a big feud with London's mayor. We're going to tell you about all of that directly ahead. Sadiq Khan made history last year when he became the first Muslim elected mayor of London. But President Trump made it known on Twitter that he wasn't too impressed with the mayor's response to Saturday's terror attack in the British capital. Khan doesn't appear to be enamored with Mr. Trump either. I don't think we should be rolling out the red carpet to uh, the president of the USA in the circumstances where his policies go against everything we stand for. I think one of the things when you have a special relationship uh, it's not different, no different to when you've got a close mate. You stand with them in times of adversity, but you call them out when they're wrong. And there are many things about which uh, Donald Trump is wrong. Kimberly, the London mayor says he doesn't want to roll out the red carpet for President Trump, but some could argue he's been really rolling the red carpet out for a lot of these Muslim extremists who've just come in and out of the country willy-nilly. Mm -hmm. So who died and made him prime minister? I don't know. <laughs> just the mayor? Right. Well, I mean, you know, just act mayoral. Um, you know, I, listen, if he can complain about him and he has it, to take issue with 
the president because he doesn't like what the president said about, you know, how he handled this. Okay, they have a disagreement about that. People think perhaps the president shouldn't have written and tweeted what he did, that perhaps the president misconstrued what Mr. Khan was saying. Okay, but nevertheless, then, what do we talk about on this show all the time? Be the bigger person then. If you feel aggrieved and you feel that he did wrong, then say, okay, let's come and work together on this and, in fact, work on common goals and interests to fight and combat an enemy that wants to see both of our countries in peril and do grave harm and injustice and commit jihad against us. That's what I think you have to do. I mean, because otherwise the, the petty back and forth, two wrongs don't make a right. We can say, I intended this, no, but he intended that, but my, no, my intentions were good. And it's just wasting time back and forth on semantics. And then let's just show by your actions how you behave. You were rolling your eyes a little bit when Kimberly was talking in the beginning. What was that about, Juan? Well, I was listening. Cause I'm I, used to that. I, wow. I, I, I really nice. appreciate her thoughts. So I was listening. But when she said, you know, that it was the mayor who really, you know, was going off, and, and I just thought to myself, what about that. President Trump? President Trump attacked the mayor. I didn't say that. I said, in fact, that he was upset with the way the president handled it and the comments that the president made on Twitter that he feels were not properly evaluating and understanding what he was trying to say. When the president said, wait a second, this many people dead, this many injured, but no one should be alarmed, and then people came to the mayor's defense and said, well, the mayor wasn't trying to say anything. He just wanted to try to instill calm no, in people the during mayor an was act of terror. And then people said, well, perhaps President uh, Trump misconstrued the mayor's comments. So he we're going did. back and forth, well, ping-ponging about the semantics. There's no semantics. The mayor said, don't be alarmed about the presence right. of so many extra police on the street to his citizens in London. The president responded that the, the mayor was making excuses and why shouldn't the people be alarmed about the threat of terrorism? Total disconnect. But you, what's telling to me is that Theresa May, the prime minister, defended the mayor. Even the acting U.S. ambassador to Britain spoke out and said the mayor has provided strong leadership in London. So this would suggest to me that there's a wide sense, and even among the British people, that they praise their security forces, they praise their mayor, and they, they don't have any trouble. It's President Trump who's picking a fight with our ally. Well, I think he was finishing a fight, and because this guy, the mayor, you know, caused a lot of drama with Trump's travel ban and his wall many, many, many He's not months innocent before. In terms of his um, Dana, do you think as the first Muslim mayor of London, he feels an added pressure to deal with these radical extremists in his own city, or does he just take that out of the equation. Well, I saw additional commentary from him where he was speaking to um, radical Islamic terrorists and saying, you are, this will not stand for me. I, so, so perhaps, and look, that's not a terrible thing. I think this whole dispute is uh, so, such a shame and completely unnecessary. And uh, it would be great if the leaders could come together and say, like, actually, we're all on the same side here. But um, I don't see the president doing that, and I don't think the mayor would accept it either. I think that both of them are also playing to their domestic audiences, and there's actually really no time for politics here. We have people who are trying to kill us, so we should just all be on the same page. Um, Greg, I want to play a soundbite from Hillary Clinton's former spokesperson, emphasis on former, who said this about President Trump. The president likes to pick on people of color and set them up as foils. Oh. If you think of the people he sets out and embarks on Twitter wars with, you have talking? Mayor Khan, you have Keezer Khan, you have Judge Curiel. He likes these foils that set up a narrative that caters to a certain element in his base that he likes to send dog whistle no, signals no. to. It. The president doesn't discriminate when he attacks people. Yeah, he doesn't have to rosy and he's jeb. Right, he's right, though. He picks on people of color. All color. <laughs> Every single color. Yeah. I mean, that's why I don't think, um, I, think I, 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 I think Mayor Khan is okay. He, he's just got to realize he's not special. Trump does this to everyone. Right. He's an equal opportunity negative tweeter. <laughs> and I think that Trump was wrong to do that. He shouldn't have done that. But, you know, you know the thing is, Trump can be wrong on these small things. Yeah. But his response is somewhat closer to the assumptions, fears, and desires of the general public in England and America. He represents the concerned public, 
more than Khan does. You could argue that Khan is an ostrich. He's somebody that buries his head in the sand about the bigger issues, about Islamophobia, phobia, about dealing with the, the incoming threats, about dealing with what's already there and how to deal with these mosques. He has big problems focusing on Trump. I get it. But Trump is actually maybe closer to the street than Khan ever will be. Wow, that's a big indictment of the mayor. All right, President Trump ordered his administration to find the leakers. The feds say they just nabbed one. We'll give you the details up next. Welcome back. President Trump has ordered his administration to find all leakers of classified information. Over the weekend, the FBI nabbed his first suspect in the Trump era. 25-year-old federal contractor, reality winner, has been charged with violating the Espionage Act. Winner is alleged to have mailed a classified document about Russian efforts to influence the 2016 election to the news website, The Intercept. She faces up to 10 years in prison. Jesse, and no, we did not make up that name. Yeah, I mean, is, that should have set off... Is reality winner fired? Yes. <laughs> Get her out of here. I mean, that name should have set off alarm bells. Her parents were obviously hippies. And I had a little fun with her. Your parents are hippies. I know. Look how I turned out. I rebelled. Um, no, I mean, she's got... If you look at her social media, I mean, she said that being white is terrorism. She called President Trump the C-word. She called him an orange fascist. She's a Black Lives Matter supporter. She's feeling the burn, big Bernie Sanders supporter. She, she loves Anderson Cooper and all these people like Bill Maher and, and Michael Moore. Um, Don't but, say Kathy she, Griffin. No, yeah, please. She, but she's not even a good leaker. Apparently they caught her because she had all the pages folded over and then it like all got sent back to her email. But this should really send a chill down the spines of all these leakers in the administration. I'm glad they finally got someone. And I think there's more where that came from. Well, it seems, Anna, that people are very frustrated and upset about this. And, um, you know, should she be treated? any differently than if it was, you know, a man, older man in the business for however long nope. that got charged and mm -hmm. caught with this. Absolutely not. And if you if you want a career in intelligence, I think one of the best things that you can do, young people, is just shut you down your social media accounts. Yeah. Um, also, don't smoke, smoke marijuana because it's still illegal in the federal government and they will not pass you through the drug test. Uh, the Did other thing is, I would way? say, no, I just know that, <laughs> I know that this is actually a problem in the federal government right now, that they try to hire young people, they want to hire them, and then all of a sudden they want to send them to the drug test. They're like, oh, you know what? I just took a job at Whole Foods. I think I'm good. Um, and I know this for a fact is happening. But That's my problem. point is, that, well, that is a problem, but it is just get that, this, that is You get the these law. people instead. Um, I'll take a pothead. I, this is what I would tell her. She's lazy to leak. It's not worth it, right? So it's not glamorous. She is not going to be Ed Snowden. She didn't have the presence of mind to, like, ask no. the Russians to, like, bail her out. Possibly because the actual underlying story of what she leaked is very eye-opening. I mean, we shouldn't pass over the fact that there is more to this. But what I want to say to these young people is if you feel that in that strongly about it, there is an investigation. There is a special counsel. Let that play out. If at the end of that you still feel like there was something wrong, go to your superior. Do not go to the press. It will not turn out well for you. Yeah, don't you will commit, ruin your life. Don't commit crimes against the country. She's facing 10 years now right. because she broke the law. You might be short of cash someday, Greg, but do you go rob a bank? I've thought about it. You know, the lesson from, <laughs> the lesson from Snowden is extreme vetting is necessary for people who work in intelligence. How did this person get clearance is what I want to know. Sad. She's 25 years old. She's highly politically motivated, no real life experiences, wisdom. Right. And when you lack wisdom, you are gullible, you are easily influenced. You are the type of person who might do something like this, well, and I don't a, think you'd be a trusted. A double agent. And she sees herself as a social justice warrior. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, you, I, we're living in a world where the people who keep us safe are at the mercy of people who seek sainthood, mm. because we will make her into a hero. No question about it. She is so? She's fulfilling the fantasy of MSNBC. Yeah. She's, she's feeding into the idea that somehow the Russians were involved, not colluding. There's no evidence of colluding, but they were involved. That feeds into a, a huge narrative that the left loves. The she will be, uh, Jennifer Lawrence will probably be playing her in three years. Yeah, Je I mean, you sure, Jennifer Lawrence? <laughs> well, they're always, you know, with different, you know. It's actually possible. Take a look at her. It's delicate. She's going to be playing me, by the way, in my movie. Well, let me just say that, Great in fact... 25 years old, but she was an Air Force veteran. So she had been... I stand the, corrected. I okay. stand corrected. So she'd been in the Air Force, and I think she must have had some clearance at that point to do what she was doing. Uh, and I think she had a loyal service to the country in the Air Force and honorably discharged, and that's mm -hmm. what got her into these positions. 
What interests me here is a couple things. One is WikiLeaks is now trying to go after this publication, Intercept, which published the revelations on Monday. WikiLeaks says they want the reporter fired because they said the reporter but essentially outed her. This is the, here's the issues because WikiLeaks, Assange, and Glenn Greenwald, weren't they, you know, basically, metaphorically, in bed together <laughs> yes. from the start? Yes. And so you have Assange now, in fact, saluting her and saying it's yes. great that non-elite opinions and information is going to the public. And to come back to Dana's point, I think it's important that we say that what the document allegedly said was that the Russians had succeeded with spear phishing attacks on local election offices in the country with the intent of disabling right. the election machines. This is important but, information. But, but you know what phishing is? It's just trying to get your password. We understand. People mistake phishing for hacking. We have the little signs all over our company. Right. Try to ha make sure you have a good password. Fish. So it's, it's, it's preying on people who, who aren't changing their passwords or their passwords are so dog. Like watch the local, like Waters yeah. World. Waters no, I know, world. No, but that isn't <laughs> hacking. <laughs> That's not <laughs> hacking the machine. Password. All lowercase and everything. Um, Monty Kane okay, you gets just told the entire case. country my password. No, but but it isn't like hacking right, machines. You make a great you point. How did she get through this? It's pretty obvious. If you go through, well, and Jesse, you touched on this. I mean, right? She was in the Air Force. So she has top um, secret security. That's account. probably it. It was the Air Force. Farsi, Dari, and Pasha. Like, can you? And she said, I should have read this. A source war material. with the Iranians, she would be with the mullahs. Like it's against the president. Yeah. I mean, does it get worse than that? I'll and this is out. all just like open source intelligence that a seventh can I, grader can go online. Can I defend her about. though for what on one specific? You thing? already said Jennifer Lawrence would play her. Know. Know. <laughs> unlike nice unlike Snowden and Chelsea Manning, who, who dumped thousands and millions of right. documents, right. indiscriminate documents that her, that right. a, a foreign uh, that jeopardized uh, you know foreign intel. She was highly specific about the things she did. Who let did. them go? Who? What? Not Trump. What do you mean? Because these are, this was under the Obama administration. Yeah. These, no, but I'm just saying, I'm giving her but credit Snowden for only going after one thing. bring him back. Yeah. He should be in trouble, too. And Chelsea Manning, like, who would give him a pardon, right? Yeah. I mean, her. come on. It's a big Her a pardon. <laughs> I mean, it's a big problem. I, it shouldn't be tolerated, and there shouldn't be exceptions given, to be honest. It okay. doesn't matter if you're a feel-the-burn person or whatever issue. All right. A major military offensive on ISIS capital in Syria is currently underway. Details straight ahead. That is a strange, um, anyway. According to a statement from Operation Inherent Resolve, what we call the anti-ISIS coalition, U.S.-backed forces have launched an offensive to drive ISIS from Raqqa, the so-called capital of the Islamic State. Recently, Rob O'Neill, the guy who killed bin Laden, told me the only way to destroy ISIS was to take back Raqqa and Mosul, to prove the Islamic State was no state at all. Because once you do that, you prove everything that ISIS has said to its groupies is a big, fat lie. Exposing that they are deadbeats makes it hard for them to recruit new bodies. No one wants to join a loser. ISIS was able to recruit because they portrayed themselves as teeming hordes raging across the desert, forcing those in their path to bend to their brutal demands. And they said God approved. For some reason, we took forever to counter this message. We thought they were JV. So we let it slide as sexual losers the world over bought into this ISIS fantasy. Now we, have, we must kill them all. And it seems that that's the plan. For example, you don't hear much about taking prisoners anymore. Maybe I've missed it, but I haven't seen a single prisoner. And ever since that first Gulf War, we've gotten used to seeing the marched surrenders, the taking of cities, the toppling of statues. Yet we see so little of that now. Maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe it's because what we're doing now is so unbending and so relentless the way it should have been all along. Dana, I don't know if my reasoning is correct. I know there's no press so I'm wondering if, it, what, if it's a chicken or the egg. Is there no press, so will there, there will be no mercy? Or there's just no press there, and that's well, why we don't are, see it. There are some very brave journalists, but yeah. also I think that it's so dangerous, and they cannot guarantee their safety, and so they've had to, to move back. Some of the most moving pictures that have actually spurred us to action has been because reporters have, that have been um, there on the ground have been able to capture them. Uh, it is true that inaction has consequences, and uh, so President Trump is having to deal with that. Um, pray for the innocents on the ground. They've been trying. We are.
coalitions done a good job of trying to protect them, but you know that ISIS has a lot. figured out a way to, to, to do that. I imagine that uh, President Erdogan will remain quiet. I, I would believe that President Trump and Erdogan talked about that, and that Erdogan, even though it pains him because he doesn't like the Kurds, right. um, that he will do that. Um, I do think it's critically important that we deny safe haven uh, in this area, but remember what we're talking about in the A block. ISIS is already figuring out a way to evolve. And so their online recruitment has actually stepped up. And what they are, their instructions now are, don't come to the caliphate. Just go somewhere else. Do, some, do whatever you can in your area. And here are some, you know, X, Y, Z, how to do it. It seems, though, that, you know, Jesse, uh, they're predicting a long battle because they've had so much time to prepare and they're entrenched. Right. Uh, but if, 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 they, if we take Raqqa, there's nowhere, there's very little else for them left, I think. I think they retreat somewhere more towards the west, but it's going to be kind of close combat, door to door. There's probably going to be wired explosives. You know, we've given the Kurds a lot of military hardware, a lot of heavy weaponry, um, even some vehicles, and we're actually flying in reinforcements behind enemy lines. We have special operators mm -hmm. embedded with these Kurdish forces. So I think we're doing all the right things. And you know, if these two capitals fall, Mosul, and, um, and this place right here, I think that sends a real just strong signal to the rest of the world that I think will dampen down recruitment. But also, you know, I think President Trump will be judged on action, concrete action. Well, the other whether thing the is wall is built, whether ISIS loses these strongholds, whether taxes are cut. You know, <laughs> actually, President Obama was more judged on aspirations and words. But I think if you knock down these two pillars, Raqqa, and Mosul, I think that's going to be a very, very strong state. The other thing President Trump is doing is letting the military do their job. They're yeah. not trying to run this out of the National Security Exactly. Council. Or limit rules of engagement. This has been a really compelling strategic battle that is being waged here. And in terms of really making sure that the routes on the way even to, um, you know, are okay, meaning they wanted to make sure that the SDF, the Democratic forces there, were able to get through and have easy paths of egress and ingress back and forth. That's part of battle success and mission readiness. So they made sure to take that. And that took time to be able to do. This isn't going to be a quick, easy battle, but it's definitely yeah. one worth fighting. And it's not just because it, to you know, make them extinct, but it is also to send a message to those that would seek to join ISIS and that they seek to recruit. We have now then destroyed your two twin capitals of the caliphate mm -hmm. by being able to take Raqqa and by being able to take Mosul. That is very important psychologically to try to like stamp out some of this resistance and people trying to like join them again. You know, uh, there's always this left-wing idea, Juan, that you know if you if you take battle, the terrorists means the terrorists have won. It's like, no, 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 no. I mean, look. I mean, in fact, I would point out to you this started last November that it is now escalated to the point that we are entering but we're doing so with some care because as you may have read you know the ISIS people dress up the civilians right. in battle fatigues intending to confuse us they put blankets over big buildings and mm -hmm. streets so that our bombers can't see you have to do it in such a way that you're not hurting civilians and then inspiring further generations of hatred or anger. I don't think anybody's thought about that. No, of course, we, everybody. Really. I mean, that's the By reality. the way, because that's why we, in fact, did just that and told them and told the civilians and gave ample warning in advance that we're coming and that you should leave the area to, in fact, make sure that we minimize civilian casualties. You want your city back? We've got people, Democratic forces, to go in place, to take the town over, to bring you back and restore order after they're gone. Come back, and this town will be yours But the again. question is whether or not those civilians can get out without ISIS, in fact, killing them. I mean, this, this well, is part well, of they the were there with them. And they're holding them hostage. Right, that's, what, that's, I'm why they that's what I'm trying to Make say. Make sure that you leave so that they don't use you as human shields, they don't hold you hostage, they don't kill you on the way. It decreases their battle. Yep, what I'm saying it's hard for them to leave if they're being held hostage. Anyway, I just, I, I applaud it. I, I'm all for it. By the way, I think they go to Mosul. I mean, they, they have already started to shift some. And, and the key point here is that it is a cancer. It has metastasized. It's online. It's very difficult. All right. President Trump sent a message to his fired FBI director today ahead of his testimony on Capitol Hill. His four words are James coming next. Former FBI Director James Comey testifies Thursday for the first time since he was fired by President Trump, and he could detail his private conversations with the president on the Russia investigation. 
Mr. Trump had some interesting words for him today. President, what message do you have to him? Call me ahead of his testimony. I wish him luck. <laughs> well, in fact, uh, everybody's asking, what is he going to do during this period, Greg? And apparently, uh, Robert Costa of the Washington Post says he's going to live tweet. He's going to be responding. He's just like us. <laughs> he, this president <laughs> is just like us. Every, he's the closest you get to the average. This is how we treat the Oscars, the Grammys. We live tweet something that is really boring in order to make it interesting and fun. He is going to get bored watching the hearings, so he's going to sit there and tweet. This is exactly what I do when, I, when I'm watching a five repeat. I'll sit there and I'll tweet. <laughs> it. It's like a judge on The Voice, you know, heckling well, one like of the contestants. Like when you watch The Bachelorette. Yes, exactly. And, or it's a crazy version of Mystery Science Theater. All right, so Dana, the Wall Street Journal today says he should stop tweeting. I mean, this is self-destructive to quote them. Do you think he should stop tweeting? Trump, on the other hand, says fake mainstream media working so hard to get me not to use social media. They hate that I can get honest, unfiltered messages out. I actually think the media <laughs> loves it. I don't think the media wants him to stop tweeting. I think that you have people, especially behind the scenes, if the sources are to be believed, that are uh, on the staff or that is part of his legal team that are hoping that he doesn't. But I, I think that what we'll see is, a, this, this is the ongoing reality show that is this testimony that's coming up on Thursday. Um, I just see, feel like people are prejudging the outcome and they're over-dramatizing the testimony before it even happens. Usually congressional hearings are very boring. Um, but... Possibly not in this case, and because Fox News will have live coverage from 9 to 12, special coverage, and I'm going to join, nice I plug. think, Brett, Shannon, Bill, Hemmer, Chris, Wallace, maybe Tucker, too. Well, I'm going to be there. They did? Did I list everybody? Oh, my gosh. Everybody's there. You got everybody, okay. actually. In, in fact, a few that weren't mentioned, so nice oh. of you. Okay. <laughs> I can't believe Greg says the hearings are going to be boring while Dana's going to be covering them <laughs> and that Greg watches I'm going to live tweet it. Five. Yeah, way, way to be a team player. <laughs> what do you, I even watch your, honest. like, excessive waving thing, the extreme waving at the end. She, never, right. she doesn't miss a moment. I love we're, we're out of time for this segment. One more thing's up next. <laughs>